Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Today, I'll set out the latest assessment of the COVID data and its impacts, and I will give brief updates on some key issues, uh, the ongoing consideration of guidance for schools and early year settings, surveillance of the BA2 subtype of Omicron and the progress and current focus of vaccination efforts. I'll conclude then with a reminder that there are still some basic steps we can and should continue to take, even in an improving situation, to curb transmission and thereby reduce pressure on the NHS economy and wider society. Um, I'll start, though, with a brief account of today's statistics. 6,630 positive cases were reported yesterday through PCR and lateral flow tests. 950 people are in hospital with COVID, uh, which is eight fewer than yesterday. 31 people are in intensive care, five fewer than yesterday. Uh, that includes 13 patients who have been in ICU for more than 28 days. And sadly, a further 14 deaths have been reported, which takes the total number of deaths under the daily definition to 10,447. And once again, my condolences go to everyone mourning a loved one. Uh, over the past fortnight, case numbers have remained broadly stable. Uh, last week, I reported that cases had risen slightly by around 2% in the preceding seven days. By contrast, over the past week, the most recent week, reported case numbers have declined again from an average of 7,400 a day to just over 7,000 a day, which is a fall of 5 per cent. Uh, while that continues a positive overall trend, it's important to note that it does mask some significant variations between different age groups. Amongst the under 15s, which, uh, remember, is the age cohort in which cases have been rising in recent weeks, even as they declined overall. Uh, but in the most recent week, there was a fall of more than a quarter amongst the under 15s. Cases also fell by 6% in the 25 to 44 year old age group and by more than 10% in those aged 75 and over. However, in other age groups, recorded cases have increased over the past week and the biggest increase of more than 50% was seen in the 15 to 24 year old cohort. As I have noted in recent weeks, it was always likely that we'd see some uptick in recorded cases as a result of the return to work and school after Christmas and more recently, the lifting of protective measures that had played a part in stemming transmission. So we shouldn't be overly surprised by the increase in some age groups nor at this stage should we be unduly concerned. However, we will continue to monitor these trends and any associated impacts from them. In addition to the daily data, we also continue to pay close attention to the findings of the ONS weekly survey. While it is not as up-to-date as the daily data, it does offer reliable information. The most recent reports suggest that in the week to the 29th of January, around 1 in 30 people in Scotland had COVID. While this is an improvement on the earlier part of January and the lowest level of infection of all four UK nations, it also represents something of a plateau compared to the week before and is broadly in line with what the more recent daily data has been indicating. The decline and the subsequent plateauing in recorded cases in recent weeks is now being reflected in a slight easing of the direct COVID pressure on our hospitals. In the week to 27th January, 682 patients with COVID were admitted to hospital. In the following week, uh, that fell to 550. Hospital occupancy, the number in hospital with COVID at any given time, has also fallen. Around mid-January, more than 1,500 people were in hospital with COVID. This time last week, that had fallen to just under 1,200, and today it is back below 1,000 at 950. Uh, the number of people with COVID in intensive care has also reduced from a recent peak of 70 in January to 42 last Tuesday and 31 today. Indeed, the number in intensive care is now at its lowest level since early July of last year. Um, and we are also now, thankfully, starting to see a decline in the number of deaths of people with COVID. So these are all positive trends uh, that we hope to see continue in the weeks ahead. Uh, finally, on data, I just want to take the opportunity now to flag an imminent change to the rhythm of our reporting. Uh, this coming weekend will be the last, at least for now, that we report data for new cases, vaccinations and hospitalisations on Saturdays and Sundays. In future, figures for Saturday and Sunday will be published on Mondays. 
Uh, this reflects the move, we hope, into a calmer phase of the pandemic and so less of an urgent requirement for immediate data over weekends. However, we will be able to move back to weekend reporting should that become necessary at any stage in the future. The situation now remains much more positive uh, than it was at the turn of the year. I think that is evident from all of the data. Uh, and that, of course, is thanks uh, to a combination of vaccinations, targeted protective measures and the responsible reaction of the public. And of course, the situation is much more positive now than we feared it might be at this stage. It seems reasonable, uh, therefore, based on the data, to conclude that we are now through the worst of this wave of Omicron. Uh, that has enabled the removal of virtually all of the additional measures that were introduced in December and a return to normality in much of our everyday lives. In particular, the updated guidance on homeworking has supported a partial return to the office in recent days with hybrid working where appropriate. Uh, these changes have all, I'm sure, been very positive for individuals and for businesses, and they mean that we are on a good track at this stage. To stay on this track, though, continued care and caution remains uh, necessary and prudent, uh, while much more stable than it was. Uh, the virus is still widespread. One in 30 remains, at this stage, a high level of infection. And although the number needing hospital care is reducing, it is still in the hundreds each week and pressure on the NHS remains significant. So continuing to take some basic precautions will help us keep the virus under control while, of course, enjoying the return to normal life. That is why some baseline protective measures such as COVID certification and the requirement to wear face coverings in certain settings will remain in force for now. And it is also why we continue to recommend that we all take lateral flow tests before mixing with people from other households. As well as reducing our own individual risk of getting COVID and therefore helping to stem transmission overall, these basic measures will also provide some reassurance for those who are at the highest risk of serious illness if they get COVID. It's important, uh, and I'm sure we'll all agree with this point, it's important that everyone gets to benefit from a return to greater normality. So collective behaviours that could force those at highest risk into effective isolation while the rest of us get back to enjoying normal life would not be acceptable. Uh, people in the higher risk category already carry a lot of responsibility for protecting their own health and rely on the advice of GPs and other clinicians to reduce risks of infection. As we enter the next phase of the pandemic, regular communication from the Scottish Government and the Chief Medical Officer will seek to support this. However, we all have a part to play in making the environments in which we work and socialise as safe as possible for everyone. And complying with basic protective measures helps to do this. Employers, of course, have a particular responsibility to consider the needs of people on the high risk list in their plans for hybrid working. Uh, we've added some specific workplace guidance for people at highest risk on mygov.scot, so anyone on the high risk list who is worried about a return to the workplace is encouraged to check that advice and discuss it with their employer. Uh, finally, I'm pleased to say there's been already good take up of the distance aware scheme that was launched two weeks ago. This scheme provides badges and lanyards that can be worn by anyone who wants or needs additional space and consideration when they are out and about in public places. Uh, these are available at ASDA stores and in libraries for anyone who would feel safer with a bit more space around them. And of course, if you see someone wearing uh, one of these distance aware uh, badges or lanyards, please respect that and give them the space and consideration that they are asking for. Uh, there are three further issues, presiding officer, that I want to briefly cover today. Firstly, and as I indicated last week, the advisory subgroup on education is meeting this afternoon. It will consider again, based on the up-to-date data, whether secondary school children should continue to wear face coverings in the classroom. Uh, the Scottish Government will consider carefully any further advice that the subgroup provides and confirm any decisions as quickly as possible and in advance of the return to school after the February break. Uh, secondly, we continue to monitor the BA2 subtype of Omicron. Last week, I indicated that there were 26 cases of this subtype confirmed in Scotland through genomic sequencing. I can report today that the number of confirmed cases has now risen to 103. Uh, not all tests are or can be genomically sequenced, so we know that this will be a significant underestimate of actual prevalence. 
And indeed, in the past week, there has been a further increase in the number of PCR test results showing positive for the S gene and a corresponding fall in the number which don't have the S gene. This is likely to reflect an increase in BA2 cases, uh, which, like Delta, are S gene positive. Uh, of course, in cases of the main Omicron variant, the S gene is absent. Encouragingly, there remains no evidence at this stage that the disease caused by this subtype is any more severe than that caused by the main Omicron variant, nor does it appear to be any more capable of evading the immunity confirmed, conferred by either vaccination or prior infection. However, there is evidence uh, from more than one country now of a growth advantage for BA2 compared to the main Omicron variant, which may mean that it is more transmissible. All in all, however, there are no grounds at this stage for any significant concern about this subtype and no reason to change our approach in response to it. We will, though, continue to monitor it carefully. Uh, the final issue I want to address today is vaccination. We are continuing to offer and encourage vaccination for any 5 to 11-year-old who has an underlying health condition, putting them at higher risk should they get COVID and also for any 5 to 11 year old who is a household contact of someone who is immune suppressed. All parents and carers of children in these categories have been contacted about vaccination. I would strongly encourage anyone who has been contacted and whose child has not yet been vaccinated to book an appointment. Case rates in younger age groups, while now falling, as I indicated earlier, are still relatively high. So vaccination is an important way of providing better protection for children who might be at higher risk. A new marketing campaign is also being launched today to stress again the importance of vaccination, including booster vaccines. Invitations to scheduled appointments have been going out to all 18 to 59 year olds who are eligible for a booster but haven't yet received it. If you are one of these people, please do go along to your scheduled appointment or rearrange it for a more convenient time. And you can do that through the NHS Inform website or by phoning the vaccination hotline. It is beyond any doubt that getting the booster significantly reduces your chance of falling seriously ill from COVID. It's not an exaggeration to say that it could be the difference between life and death for someone who contracts the virus. So please do go and get your booster if you're eligible. It is the most important thing any of us can do to protect ourselves from COVID and also to help protect the NHS. Siding officer, the ongoing use of vaccination in our efforts against COVID will be a key part of an updated strategic framework which will set out in greater detail our approach to managing COVID more sustainably and less restrictively in the remaining phases of the pandemic and then as the virus hopefully becomes endemic. We continue to engage with a range of interests on the contents of this updated framework. However, I can confirm today that we intend to publish it on the 22nd of February, immediately following the February recess. Parliament will subsequently get an opportunity to debate and vote on it. Uh, for the moment, however, I want to end today by reflecting again our increased optimism about the period ahead. However, after almost two years of uh, this ordeal, I know getting back to normal for short periods followed by further disruption to our lives is not what any of us want. A return to normal that is sustained is what we want and are striving for, and that is what the updated strategic framework will be aiming to support. However, we can all help keep things on a more even keel now by taking all of the reasonably straightforward precautions that we continue to advise. Uh, so firstly, a reminder to please get fully vaccinated as soon as you can if you haven't already done so. Uh, second, continue to take some care when socialising and in particular take a lateral flow test before meeting other people socially. And finally, uh, please take the other precautions that we know are making a difference. Uh, talk to your employer about a return to hybrid working and follow the guidance and precautions they adopt to make workplaces safer. Uh, wear face coverings on public transport and shops and when moving about in hospitality. Keep windows open uh, if possible when meeting indoors and follow all of the advice on hygiene. All of these measures will help us to protect each other while we return to more normal lives and keep all of us, I hope, on the right track. So please uh, stick with them. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm happy now, of course, to move to questions. Thank you. The First Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 30 minutes for questions, after which we'll move on.